that sort of table. They've got t-shirts on, they're pretty easy to find. They've got the same logo as our little band down there, so go and yarn to them. Um, we do a social drinks on the third Wednesday of every month, so the week after this event, and that sort of rotates where it's going to be. This month it'll be at um, Smash Palace next week from 6 o'clock, so feel free to come on and chat to us there if you'd like to. And hopefully the whiskey that's right. Um, and happy birthday to our member Paul, who's down the front here. Um, I'm not going to make everyone sing happy birthday, but if we want to later, we probably could. He'd hate it, so I think we should do it. Um, anyway, that's pretty much it as far as the admin side of things go, so we'll get into the talk. Uh, you probably know what it's about, but um, what do we call it? What happened to Labour? So when we say what happened to Labour is a reference mostly to the Labour Party, which is perhaps slightly broader than that as well. And I think the sub-title uh, that we chose for Quentin was a bit of a provocation, um, implying that a mix of postmodernism and Gramsci uh, helped uh, lubricate the, the transition into the period of what we call the new right or the third way in Labour politics. Um, it'll be a very interesting talk, I think. Um, I'm really happy to welcome Quentin to speak again. He's spoken for us a couple of times, and I believe this is um, a lot of this talk is based on his master's thesis from a few years ago. Um, but he's, he's revisiting that topic for us tonight. Um, Quentin is a union organizer. In the late 80s, he was president of Labour Youth, which is what young Labour used to be called. Um, and he, along with the vast majority of that part of the party and about a third of the party overall, all left in the late 80s and pretty much joined New Labour. Um, which later became the Alliance, which you may have heard of, and then they um, joined with what was then the Green Party, and it was all called the Alliance, and then the Green Party moved again. So depending how old you are, some of that might sound familiar to you, some of it will be a complete mystery because the Alliance and so on sort of uh, wound up in the early noughties. Um, nonetheless, uh, Quentin, when he's talking about the transition into the New Right period and sort of uh, Roger Douglas and people like that who adopted these uh, big market reforms and marketization of labor politics and this um, new sort of way of uh, monetary and financial policy for the state and so on. He was there at the time, he saw it all happen, he saw some very good and uh, I think um, respected uh, comrades and, and, and fellow travelers of the movement, labor historians and so on, somehow lose the plot and end up fans of Roger Douglas, even during the ACT Party, which I was very shocked to hear in the other night when I was checking, checking to Quentin in the pub about one of my favorite wee historians, which was quite depressing. Um, you know, this was a, it was an interesting wave that overtook in New Zealand politics and we were a curious country in that all of our sort of new right uh, reforms came from a Labour Party government um, to start with and that's not actually the way it seems to have happened in most countries. So that's part of why New Zealand is uh, a bit shit in some ways now. And I'll let Quentin elaborate on that for us all. Thank you. I don't need that. So, thanks for having me here. Uh, basically, um, as Tom said, it's been a long, long time since I've actually done this stuff. I used to be quite enamoured with it back in the very early 1990s. So, I had a chance to look over my um, PhD, was it, my honours thesis and so on from 1992, and then my master's from about ninth, um, what was it, 2000. So essentially, you know, it's been a long time since I've looked at that, and I can come to the conclusion that even after 20 years, it's still absolute complete shit. But, you know, so we'll, we'll sort of deal with that. I don't know how many people here actually know, basically, uh, what New Labour is. Tony Blair, do you people know? Yep, yep, yep. And the rest of you, I'm assuming, don't know. How many of you know who Grumshi is? Ah, yes, that's good, that's good. He's my idol, I love Grumshi. And of course, how many here know what the New Times and Marxism today is? Thanks, Martin and John. <laughs> yeah, I knew that you would. So look, this is actually about a combination of all those things. So I think there's enough in here to actually offend everyone in this room. So you know, I can already see Paul Hopkinson, you know, getting all quite worked up and so on about it. And don't worry, I guarantee that at the end of this, you'll be either utterly confused or you'll be basically along the lines of, I really hate these people, or both. <laughs> so we'll find out. So really what we're looking at, oh, before I go on to I want to thank uh, basically Sam for bringing his computer. And I also want to actually thank Matt Gibson, who has actually volunteered to actually uh, do a, a praises of the sort of talk tonight. So thanks, Matt. 
So the entire aim behind this is to look at how, in fact, the Labour parties here in the UK, oh, sorry, in the UK and here in New Zealand, change from Harry Holland to Jacinta, and of course from Kira Hardy to Tony Blair, and now of course Keith Stammer. How did this actually happen? Now some people say, well, you know, basically it was a, a sort of something that happened naturally and so on anyway, but I disagree with that. It didn't actually happen at all. This is really the story about new times. New times and the third way. And it all comes from a magazine that is called Marxism Today. Okay? A great magazine put out by the Communist Party of Great Britain has advertisements in it. Very glossy. <laughs> And that was the in thing to read back in the 1980s. And so that's what we're going to do. So I'll give you a bit of background. The genesis of New Times was in the late 1970s. And in the late 1970s, those of you who were old enough will remember that basically we're suffering from a number of crises. And so there was a mass unemployment. There was economic and social pressures brought about by that. There was basically the growing economic deficit, which is something the new right really campaigned on, the, the amount of public spending that was going on and so on like that. High interest rates and high inflation. You think you've got high inflation now? is nothing compared to what happened in the 1970s. And governments throughout the Western world attempted to resolve these issues, and they met with really little discernible results. So they tried to prime the pump, they tried to intervene, they tried to all do all these things. And it resulted in this situation that they called stagflation, which was a combination of high inflation, high interest rates, growing government debt, and of course, high unemployment. And as a result, there was a growing disenchantment because the labour movement in a lot of cases was actually in power and so on, particularly in the UK during this period of time. And there came growing disenchantment with the practices and policies of, of Labour and social democratic parties throughout in this period. Because these parties seemed unable to deal with the economic crisis and or deliver on their policies and programs. So they couldn't deliver, for example, increased wages. They couldn't deliver and so on in terms of unemployment. They couldn't deliver on all these things. And they were getting quite a lot of stick and so on from, I can imagine, from their supporters and from the labour movement and so on in general. And as a result, some within the labour movement felt that traditional social democratic or socialist programs could not operate in the new political and economic environment. They argued that socialism could only be revived and social democracy could only be revived and returned to power by accepting elements of the new consensus that was being set out, of course, by people like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and so on like that. So, in electoral politics, as I said, in both the UK and New Zealand Conservative parties had dominated Parliament. So here in New Zealand, for example, the National Party was actually the most successful post-war party in the Western world. I think it won 35... Um, 35 years in power all the way up to about 1984. So it was very, very successful. And the electoral success of the Conservative parties and so on, including in Britain, lay in their ability to convince a majority of workers that economic and political success lay in supporting and really adopting their policies and programs. Okay, and that's basically what was actually happening and so on. That was the campaign for the Conservative Party in 1979, Labour isn't working, and that of course is the winter of discontent, which basically happened in Britain in 1978-79, when the unions went on strike, of course, for higher wages and better conditions. And so what they argued was that basically the Conservatives argued that their ability was really to convince the majority of workers that economic and political success lay in supporting and adopting policies that were actually fundamentally opposed to what workers actually wanted. And that social and socialist and social democratic policies were actually fundamentally detrimental to their well-being, to the well-being of workers. Okay, that was their argument. And as I said, nowhere was the success of this deception more evident than with the rise of neoliberalism. 
which was personified in the UK by, of course, Margaret, Mrs. Thatcher, who had a very large handbag. And ironically, in New Zealand, by Roger Douglas, and the first act, of, I mean, the fourth Labour government. Okay, so essentially, both Thatcher and Douglas had a profound impact on the economic direction of their respective nations and on the political culture within those nations. At the heart of their program was a rejection of the post-war social democratic consensus that basically regulation, public ownership, social provision and cooperation and of course full employment were essentially not only blunted the economy to grow, they argued, but actually stymied the rights, and, um, the rights and freedom of individuals and workers. As Mrs. Thatcher famously said, there is no such thing as society. Now, I want to talk about the UK Labour at this point. Um, as both the New Times and the Third Way developed in their country before influencing other Labour and Social Democratic parties. Now, in the late 1970s, the UK was governed by a minority Labour government headed by James Callaghan. And he succeeded probably Labour's most successful Prime Minister up to that point, Carol Wilson, who was a dynamo of um, ideas. I mean, sarcastically, Martin, don't worry. And as a result, when it came to the late 1970s, Britain was suffering really from a number of economic issues that Labour was really struggling to resolve. And again, it was all brought about and so on by things like the oil crisis, inflation, unemployment, and so on. Here's the, the poster and so on up there. Now, what happened was in 1975, the, in 1976, the UK government, headed by uh, basically Callaghan, by that point it might have still been Wilson, and their ex Chancellor of the Exchequer, Dennis Healy, basically attempted to borrow money and so on from the IMF. The IMF turned the Britain down flat and essentially said to the British, what you need to do is do these things, which involve cutting, of course, wages, cutting social services, and so on like that. And the Labour government's result, uh, resolve just crumbled. And in fact, at, I think, the Labour Party conference that year, Dennis Kelly uttered, Keynesianism is dead, and then proceeded to actually start to implement some of the reforms and so on that Mr. Thatcher later on went on to do. But the problem was is that by giving up on Keynesianism, Labour had effectively negated, effectively negated a central platform and called into question the party's ability to belong to deliver on this principal objectives. And that is since 1935, the Labour Party in Britain had actually been a Keynesian party. It relied and so on the Keynesian economics to drive its social program, to drive its economics. So much so that in 1935, Keynes cast, because John Maynard Keynes was actually a liberal, but he cast his only vote for the Labour Party in 1935, and he actually admitted in 1947 that Labour was far better at implementing his, you know, his economic platform than virtually any other party in, in Britain. But the result of Labour actually uh, essentially giving up on that platform, on that program, was meant that the government itself, which was, as I said, a minority government held in place with the Liberals, really quickly unraveled. British capital rebelled and sought to undermine and remove various economic regulations and restrictions, while unions concerned at the loss of conditions and lowering of wages sought to protect and extend them. The result was economic and industrial disarray, which accumulated in the industrial action that was popularly called by the sun. The winter of discontent, and so that's the picture and so on there. Essentially, garbage piled up. I'm sure that uh, Martin and John and people who were there will probably remember the winter of discontent. I'm sure Martin will probably will. And essentially, it was used by Mrs. Thatcher to motivate conservative Labour voters to actually vote against Labour. Labour isn't worth it. And, like I said, it was into this turmoil that Mrs. Thatcher, who had become leader of a very fractured Conservative Party in 1975, became Prime Minister. And Thatcher committed the Conservatives to implementing neoliberalism, fostering individual responsibility, and then ridding Britain of socialism. 
were free to find anything that was really opposed to her. Okay, and so, and it was also the problem. In fact, she said that every government since 1945 up to her had actually adopted socialism. Therefore, it had to be gotten rid of, all of it. And to prove her point, she stood on the steps of Downing Street that fateful evening when she'd become Prime Minister and quoted St. Francis of Assisi as she moved forward. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. Where there is offence, let me bring pardon. Where there is discord, let me bring union. Where there is error, let me bring truth. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring your light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. Now that was Mrs. Thatcher's promise to Britain when she got elected in May 1979. And as a result, she wasted very little time in implementing her program. And the Labour Party, one that came out, being cast into the outer darkness, wasted even less time getting to grips with itself and knifing at each other. And so essentially the knives came out in a massive round of bloodletting, which Labour parties are want to do when they've actually lost an election or they used to be want to do. The parties left argued that the election had been lost due to really the conservative no nature of the government. Tony Benn, and again another idol of mine, the left-wing MP and so on, stated in his diary that the election has, could be contributed to the following reasons. The reality, being said, is that we lost was because we had a right-wing leader, a right-wing policy, a right-wing cabinet, and a right-wing manifesto and a right-wing campaign. However, the right of the party, headed by, uh, of course, our friend, uh, essentially Dennis Healy and Jim Callaghan, said that the election loss was really due to disruptions caused by the left, and that Labour really needed to face the new economic realities, because Miss Thatcher was certainly facing them, and the right additionally did what they usually do in such situations, which was to call for unity amongst the parties, call for everyone to come together, while at the same time viciously knifing their opponents. So essentially that was how the Labour Party was coping, of course, but its loss after 1979. It got worse. Now, interestingly, the right's claims were supported by arguments coming from outside the party, specifically from the magazine of the Communist Party, Marxism Today. And as I said, I held them up before. Have they again? on here. Great magazine, like I said, very glossy pages. Now, the Communist Party of Great Britain was a thoroughly morbid organisation by the late 70s. It remained rigidly attached to the USSR and it loved Stalin. So it was very much you know, in that mind. And essentially Marxism today has started life as the mouthpiece of the Communist Party of Great Britain, the theoretical journal. And it, that's what it used to do. It used to publish large tracts of theoretical programs and programs from the USSR that were just painful to read and basically made anything that anyone else read, you know, essentially far better. And you would kill yourself after you actually read them because I read a few of them. So, but in the late 1970s, the, mar the magazine started to move away from its adherence to Stalinism and from the USSR. And it started to promote a new line of thinking that was predominantly, of course, based, or they said it was, around the, th the thoughts and programs of Antonio Gramsci, like I said, my, one of my idols. And his concepts of hegemony and Fordism. And the new editor of Marxism today, Martin Jakes, opened up the magazine to a lot, um, what was it, a wide range of writers, most of which were outside the Communist Party of Great Britain to contribute to it as a means of widening debate and discussion. At one point, Marxism today even had conservative MPs writing for it, you know, so to actually get that sort of fullness and so on of, of you know, ideas into its pages. Now, who is Gramsci and why is it so important? Well, as you can see there, Antonio Gramsci, 
was an Italian Marxist philosopher, journal, linguist, writer, and politician. And he was involved, of course, in the Italian Communist Party, uh, basically. And he became one of their leading sort of intellectuals. He wrote on philosophy, political theory, sociology, history, and linguistics. And basically, he was, for his pains, of course, imprisoned by Benito Rossellini. Uh, anyone who wants to read any Antonio Gramsci, I've got his prison notebooks and the selection from the cultural writings here. But the two most important things he did was the theory of cultural hegemony, and the other was the development of the organisational theory of Fordism. Now, some people say to me, oh, well, Quentin, these things already existed, and yes, they did. But, you know, basically Gramsci elaborated on them and gave them a, a sort of new twist. So what did he mean and so on by these terms? Cultural hegemony is the dominance of a cultural diverse society by the ruling class who manipulate the culture of that society, the beliefs, the explanations, perceptions, values and mores so that the worldwide view of the working class of the ruling class becomes the accepted cultural norm. As a universal dominant ideology, the working class worldview misrepresents the social, political and economic status quo as natural, inevitable and perpetual social conditions that benefit every social class rather than the, as an artificial social construct that benefit only the ruling class. So they con you. The second one is of course Fordism, a manufacturing technology that serves the basis of modern economic and social systems and industrialised, standardised mass production and mass consumption. The concept, of course, is named for, our, for Henry Ford, and Fordism is the epitomous manufacturing system designed to produce standardised, low-cost goods and afford its workers decent enough wages to buy them. Because, of course, it worked out that you could actually become richer if you gave your workers more and then they could go out and buy the goods. It has also been described as a model of economic expansion, a technological process based on mass production, the manufacture of standardised products in large volumes using special purpose machinery and unskilled labour. Although Fordism was a method used for improved productivity in the automobile industry, the principle could be applied to any kind of manufacturing process. And that meant, you know, essentially all the way from cars, to stools, to widgets, whatever. And in fact, society itself could be seen as running along Fordist lines with people basically essentially established in their own sets. And, you know, for example, one of the main complaints about um, the social democratic state was, you know, as Fordism was it's inherently sexist in the fact that, you know, essentially the women were already given a subordinate role and so on in the society as a homemaker. Now, Marxism today basically kick-started what was actually known in the middle of all the problems with the Labour Party and so on and the fights and this statue and so on going on. They kick-started this debate called the New Times. And what happened was in 1978 and 79, two very important ish articles were actually published. Both articles relied very heavily on what Gramsci has actually said in terms of his theories of cultural hegemony and, of course, on his theories of Fordism. Um, and what they said was that essentially Margaret Thatcher herself had created a new cultural hegemony, which Marxism today labelled as Thatcherism. Here in New Zealand, we had a similar one that they labelled, of course, as Rogenomics. Okay. Now, the first of the articles were written by Eric Hobsbawm. I take it, have people here heard of Eric Hobsbawm? You have? Yep. Marxist historian. And it was titled, The Forward March of Labour Halted. Now, Hobsbawm argued that the political and economic progress of Labour, and it had had considerable progress since the early 1900s, had, which had occurred in the 20th century, had been effectively been halted in the, 19, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and was actually now in the process of being reversed by capital. The second article was by a Marxist sociologist called Stuart Hall, 
and he titled it The Great Moving Rights Show, which I actually have a copy of in my box of tricks and so on down here. And Hall argued that Thatcherism was developing a new radical right language for political discourse. Hall knew what the Tories were doing was much more ambitious than simply ramping up orthodox conservatism. He talked about their new use of the high repertoire of anti-collectivism, which fused with popular elements of traditional philosophies and practical ideologies of the dominated classes. Thatcher and her allies, in other words, were living out Gramsci's ideas about hegemony by pursuing their politics on the terrain of common sense, kitchen table economics, the comforts of self-sufficiency, the necessity of property ownership. And one of the successes that Mrs. Thatcher had in 1979 and the early 80s was that essentially she did. She talked about economics essentially being by the kitchen table. That you're in around the kitchen table, you had to balance your budgets and so on for the house. You couldn't buy food. If you didn't have the money, you couldn't afford for food. So she made it that simple and broke it down. Of course, economies don't function like that. But the political point was not lost on those people that Mrs. Thatcher was appealing to. As well as coining the term Thatcherism six months before Thatcher had even taken power, Hall wrote about the doctrines and discourses of social market values, the restoration of competition and personal responsibility for effort and reward, the image of the overtaxed individual evacuated by welfare cobbling, an initiative set by handouts from the state. And Hall identifies something at the heart of Thatcherism that would serve the Tories well for the next four decades. In the image of the welfare scavenger, he said the new Conservatives had hit upon a well-designed folk devil. And the same is true here in New Zealand. In the 1980s, prior to the 1980s, if you received welfare, you were just seen as basically someone who had been misfortunate, someone who had lost their job, someone who basically, as a result of economic circumstances, needed to actually uh, basically have some money to tie them over. In the 80s, the language changed. It changed to one of the fact that these people were a drain and a menace on society. That it was their own fault that they were unemployed. It was their own fault that they could not make ends meet. Now, by the end of 1980s, the 1980s Marxism today had established itself as basically the leading left-wing intellectual journal in the UK. Its glossy pages were full of discussion, its writers covered the political spectrum, and it's, in the late 1980s, it spawned its most ambitious project, the New Times. Now, what is the New Times? <coughs> the New Times concept was a result of the coming together of all Marxism today's writers, or the principal ones, in 1988 at Wortley Hall, which was owned actually by the trade unions at the time. They paid apparently £180 to, you know, to attend the seminar, so that in itself speaks volumes. And the Wortley Hall meeting was the chance for the leading contributors to meet and develop a program which would be published in the magazine under the title of The New Times. And actually, it's that one there, which I used to actually own since so someone stole it, but anyway, it's another story. And essentially, again, very glossy, very full and so on of, of publications. And interviewed in The Guardian in 2015, Martin Jakes, Marxism Today's, editor recalled that the uptake of New Times, you know, that journal, that particular magazine, was fantastic. There were articles in newspapers about it, extracts were published, the, it was a major point of departure, the central idea was post-Fordism, a term that captured Western society's transitions from what was an opening editorial characterised as mass production, mass consumer, the big city, Big brother, big brother state, the spoiling housing and state and the national state to a new reality of flexibility, diversity, differentiation and decentralization. The authors of New Times argued that the rise of Thatcher 
at the end of the post-war settlement. Both Labour and the Conservatives have supported that settlement, but, uh, and under the post-war settlement, the economy and society have been state layers dependent upon regulated economies for this and this approach to society and welfare. The new society of new times was post fortis Society and the economy has shifted from organised to disorganised capitalism. The role of the collective had been replaced to that of the individuals whose responsibilities and, organ and obligations were at the centre of the new politics. And, you know, they published, spent a lot of time publishing stuff and so on on this. One of which, of course, is one of this fantastic book called Politics in an Anti-Political Age that I was forced to read in 1993 as part of my dissertation. Again, it's essentially talking uh, socialist economics from the role of the individual. If you want to know how that works, read this book. Now, the state which had provided security both economically and socially, they argued, was bureaucratic and invasive. Social security, they said, instead of freeing individuals from poverty, was responsible for their continued repression. It was centrally focused and top-down, whereas what was required was a decentralised system that allowed individuals to participate in society and the economy. Another important component involved in the establishment of post fordism had been the dominance of the market. Market mechanisms had allowed, New Times argued, new groups of consumers to come into existence and have broken down traditional groups like the working class. Whereas traditional social democratic and socialist parties had concentrated on the notion of a homogeneous working class and a post-border society that was passe, it no longer existed. The market had broken their politics, its structures, and its beliefs such as public ownership and collectivism now. So that was at the basis and so on of the New Times. Now to drive home the point, Charlie Leadbetter, uh, who was an artist, author and so on for the New Times debate, and ended up, of course, writing policy for Tony Blair, claimed that instead of focusing on nationalisation and public ownership, the socialists instead should focus on social ownership. What was social ownership? Social ownership was by having shares in companies and establishing stakeholders and so on in private firms and in public firms and so on like that. Again, as I said, public ownership for New Times was uh, say. Now, how did this feed in, of course, to uh, basically the third way and Tony Blair? Basically, very, very easily. Um, in the late 1990s, Labour and Social Democratic parties had essentially, during that time, largely accepted the neoliberal programs being put in place in the previous decade. In New Zealand, um, it was made more difficult for Labour because they were the ones actually responsible for implementing neoliberalism throughout the 1980s. So, you know, essentially, we went to places that even Margaret Thatcher didn't actually go here in this government. And the basis, really, for, for Douglas and co accepting neoliberalism was largely the same as those who accepted it in the UK Labour Party. And why did Labour, you know, essentially how did they do it? Well, because of the fact that Labour had been in opposition since 1965, Douglas and co increasingly came to believe, due to a lot of very helpful support from Treasury and uh, basically advisors in the business community that Douglas had allowed to actually advise him, that in fact really what was needed was essentially an opening up the New Zealand markets, letting the market rule, and essentially that the problem that New Zealand had was excessive government regulation and the lack of market mechanisms. It was also aided and abetted, of course, by the New Zealand Prime Minister at the time, a person who goes about us were old enough to remember, Sir Robert Maldoon. Maldoon, uh, basically, uh, what was it, as Bob Jones said, ran the, well, I think it was Longy, who said he ran it like a Polish shipyard, which may or may not have been the truth, that person I don't think it was, but essentially, Maldoon was criticised for being uh, very heavy in terms of uh, regulation. He was certainly authoritarian. And uh, what had happened was that when it came to 1984 and the election, as Bob Jones said, there were only two factors that happened in that election. 
and that was you're either for Maldun or you're against them. And essentially, you know, most people by that time were against Maldun. So he was a very large, uh, uh, very large piece in, in sort of uh, bringing neoliberalism to New Zealand. Also, here in New Zealand, too, Mrs. Thatcher did have to actually tread very carefully because the Conservatives actually didn't like Thatcher. Uh, there were a number of Conservatives who were quite bitter that she had rolled Edward Heath, and they essentially wanted their revenge on her. They weren't really set on this entire new market, <coughs> and they just really wanted old fashioned Conservatives back. And up until about 1983, when she really consolidated her, her power, she was under threat and so on from the caucus and cabinet wets. But here in New Zealand, we didn't have to worry, or Roger didn't have to worry, he essentially controlled the Labour Party. Him and his friends uh, became cabinet ministers, uh, essentially through them they controlled the whips, and through the whips, of course, they controlled the Labour Party caucus. I remember Jim Anderton actually describing sort of how it broke down and so on like that. So essentially, basically, in terms of uh, control, so democratic centralism for social democratic parties rule from the top. And so what happened was essentially in the end, everyone apart from Anderton was, was basically supportive of the new line and so on of the government. And I've said, I've had many criticisms about Jim in uh, various times, but the one thing I can honestly say about him was essentially he was the only person who was prepared to actually stand up in the 1980s in the government in the caucus and publicly say this was wrong, that they were not implementing Labour Party policy and I will give him that, that too. So essentially Rogernomics really took over the Labour Party without actually any sort of um, opposition whatsoever. And like I said it was personified under the name of Rogernomics. Now it unleashed a wave of turmoil in the Labour Party, the Labour movement and of course the wider country. It was turmoil that continued to exist even after Labour lost government in 1990. Um, simply in the same manner that Thatcher had boasted her politics had changed the UK Labour Party, Rogernomics has specifically altered the politics and ideology of the New Zealand Labour Party. And as the 1990s ground on, New Zealand Labour was actually faced with a bit of a dilemma. On the one hand, it could not and would not disown what it had done in the 1980s. Yet on the other hand, it had to walk back on the outcomes of that government. It was to recapture its working class base and its you know, progressive policy. So this is where the third way made its appearance in both the news UK and New Zealand politics. If you listened and talked to the proponents of the Third Way in the 1980s, you would have been told it was a reinvention of social democratic politics for the 1990s. No longer characterised by notions of, of left or right or socialism and capitalism, the Third Way stood for radical centralisation, or radical centralism, sorry. It typically acknowledged the reality of politics and policy making within an increasingly globalised economic system that holds liberalised international trade predicated on fair and equitable rules of engagement is preferable to economic nationalism and protectionism. Okay, so that, that was some of the stuff and so on that was actually coming out. And it accepted largely what the New Times people had actually talked about, post-Fordism, decentralisation, devolution, and of course the rise of individualism as part of the new socialism. So you can actually see here written down here, you know, all these wonderful things, the radical centre, the new democratic state, active civil society, the democratic family, the new mixed economy as opposed to the old mixed economy, uh, equality as inclusion, positive welfare, social investment state, Cosmopolitan nation, cosmopolitan, oh, I put down that twice, but it was something like um, cosmopolitan politics. It was probably best personified by, what was it, Cool Britannia, which, of course, you know, uh, Tony Blair implemented when he got into power in 1997. It was, in the words of Roy Hattersley, a man who I normally would not agree with, a series of cliches looking for a coherent thought. 
And it was quite funny that Hattersley and Tony Benn, who'd spent a large amount of time in the Labour Party loathing and hating each other, came together over their definite hatred of the New Times, uh, of the Third Way, and what it actually meant. They might have loathed each other, but they knew what they really loathed, and it was this. So, but that didn't, of course, stop them. Uh, basically, as I said, essentially, they'd largely accepted at this point the neoliberal programs. And essentially, British sociology Anthony Giddens, uh, basically, who was named as Tony Blair's favourite um, sociologist, if you really want to have a chilling night in, read the, read the New Times by Anthony Giddens, is on here. He wrote various other books like The Radicalised and The Centre and stuff like that, and Beyond Left and Right, all thoroughly riveting reads. Again, I'm being sarcastic. And he was director of the London School of Economics at the time, and one of the leading proponents of the Third Way claimed that the problem really was social democracy, or traditional social democracy, was just too connected with socialism. That was the problem. And that social democrats needed to end that relationship, and the Third Way, with its notions of radical centralism, provided power to the individual, championed a more inclusive economic policy, and the development of social investment state was that break that socialists needed. Okay. And nowhere was this break more evident than in the rewrite of, of course, the famous Clause 4 of the British Labour Party. Uh, basically, they had occurred at the same time. Now, the original clause had been proposed by the right of the party, actually by Sidney Webb and Cole in 1918, really just stymied the left. And it committed the British Labour Party to a socialist vision of socialism in which the party would secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control of each industry and service. But that was passe, passe. What do you think Tony Blair changed it to? Any thoughts? Anyone? I'm sure. Well, Tony Blair said that basically the new clause for is that Labour is a democratic socialist party. It believes that by the strength of our common endeavour, we achieve more than we achieve alone. So it is to create for each of us the means to realise our true potential and for all of us a community in which power, wealth and opportunity are in the hands of the many, not the few, but the rights we enjoy reflect the duties we owe and where we live together freely in a spirit of solidarity, tolerance and respect. As you can imagine, this went down like a pile of cold sick amongst uh, the more traditional left-wing members of the Labour Party and it still sticks with a number of people and so on today because, as someone pointed out, essentially it opened the door really to to the market uh, within Labour Party policy. So, the, as I said, the third way largely accepted the economic program of the neoliberals, sought to combine it with some of the elements of the New Times, particularly in relation to the role of the state. Uh, and as I said, a lot of the leading individuals in New Times were now writing for Tony Blair and actually in Parliament. Um, and basically they started to argue, of course, that state ownership, which in the past had been seen as a means of essentially extending the power of the collective, of giving, you know, basically people control and so on through the parliamentary representatives or through the Labour Party. Uh, some state and society was seen as an, uh, basically a hindrance. And essentially there was a push for agencies to be either run by communities of, of stakeholders or essentially by individual shareholders. They talked a lot about essentially individualism, uh, decentralisation. It's essentially, it was a complete and utter, as I said to Martin, twisting of William Morris's sort of, sort of ideals, but they had no shame, so they kept on doing that. Now, um, I'm sorry, I'm running out of breath, it's on here. Now, the new social investment stake that they taught would deliver individual rights and enhance obligations. The traditional social democratic state had limited those rights and obligations by regulation and bureaucracy. The new state would foster them via the use of stakeholder participation and market mechanisms guided by the state in partnership with private firms. 
and you can see the same language even now. It's trotted out and so on by the current government and of course by the government and of course by the Labour Party in the UK, but particularly here. You know, Labour here spends a lot of its time essentially talking about partnership, talking about consensus, but at the same time not really doing anything to actually walk back on a number of its key reforms in the 1980s. One of those, of course, and Tom and I were discussing this the other day, what would you do first of all if you were a left-wing government and so on? You know, would you be looking at repealing things like the um, Employment Relations Act and putting in a far better labour reform or something to do with Social Security or something like that? The first thing really you should actually be looking at, my argument, is to actually look at the Reserve Bank Act, the State and the um, Financial Responsibility Act. Why? Because those key things set the economic parameters of the government. They are what actually cements neoliberalism into this country. The government has never, ever done anything about those things and has not actually started to alter them fundamentally in a way that could actually seriously threaten neoliberalism. And that again flows from this belief from the um, third way of, you know, essentially that was taken up and signed, run by uh, essentially Helen Clark, really a protege to um, essentially, or rather um, Jacinta was really her protege in this, um, and it fells out very carefully in this new book, in this book called The New Politics of Third Wave for New Zealand, which I last read in 1999, and essentially again was, you know, essentially really set it out. So, the New Times had developed, uh, basically in the 1980s, a section of the left has sought to understand the rise of the free market and disenchantment of socialist economics and politics. And I think that there certainly was merit and so on in sort of discussing those sorts of things. I don't think, you know, essentially it was wrong to actually start talking about, you know, different ways that socialism could develop and looking at the wider society. It, was an attempt, as I said, by most of them to understand the divide and to overcome it, and Grumsh's analysis was a key part of their understanding. Um, and essentially, though, it failed, or rather it was horribly corrupted, of course, by essentially people who I think did actually understand Grumsh's also in theory of cultural hegemony, and essentially used it to actually create their own cultural hegemony in the way of the third way. And essentially, but at the heart of the third way, of course, an acceptance of essentially Thatcherism, of neoliberalism, of the new right. And it's an acceptance that still exists in some way now. And as I said, the task facing Blair was, and it is not simply to embrace modernity, but to offer a different view of modernity. And this, Blair and the third way had failed completely. Their vision of modernity had a serpent at its heart it had embraced modernity of Margaret Thatcher, and I could say Roger Douglas here, has accepted the economic, political, and social hegemony that they created. Further, the social investment state, really, when they talk about it, and even now, has essentially adopted the rhetoric of the conservatives, and quite reactionary conservatives at that too, is, uh, essentially is focused entirely on ending social exclusion by putting pulling the marginalised in society, but the inequalities of distribution and opportunity are to be left largely untouched. Now, Eric of Holtzborn rewrote, as they say, in 1997, and the end, this one here, where I basically see the grog, and essentially, he lamented over this, and said that the third way of modern labour had failed to break the neoliberal agenda at the same time that many of the assumptions and assertions and criticism by Marx had actually been confirmed. And 20 years on, the same situation exists. The forward march of Labour remains halted within the Labour parties, cannot go back, but yet cannot actually advance. And that's it, my voice is gone. Uh, thank you. Okay, as uh, Quentin's voice is gone, and so if we can have a little break, we might do a 10 minute and we can have a little think about if they have any questions they'd like to ask. So we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes, and I'm happy to sort of chair taking questions from the floor for Quentin. Thank you. Do you need a beer, Quentin? You got one.